Hey everybody, welcome back to 1P3 here on Reason and Theology, Louis Dizon's segment where he is going over scripture from a Catholic perspective. So he's going to give us commentary. And so far we have made it to the wisdom literature. And now we're dealing with the wisdom of Solomon. Louis, welcome back to the show. How are you? Oh, I'm doing well. Been pretty busy with various kinds of things uh you know work and phd related stuff so okay. you know always appreciate your prayers and yeah. i'm always happy to you know keep uh doing work for this um yeah, yeah it's exciting we're making we're making good progress and you know i'm always happy whenever we reach one of the euro canonical books yes. because there's not a lot of good material on this because you know, Protestants aren't covering this and Catholics. Well, you know how a lot of Catholic people are when it comes to scripture in yeah. general. Yeah, so, we need some improvement there. So definitely need some focus on the Deuterocanonicals. I'm excited about this. Definitely. So I'm getting the getting the verbum up. So, uh -huh. yeah, so all right. And we call it the Wisdom of Solomon, but there's really two different titles for the book. So Wisdom of Solomon is the title that's given in the Greek Septuagint here, Sophia Salomonos. Uh, in the Latin, it's simply referred to as the Book of Wisdom, or let me see if I put the Latin title here, Liber Sapientiae. So these are the two titles that the book is known by. Now, you can see from the title that there is a association uh, between the book and the character of Solomon. And that is something that uh, is important to discuss when talking about the background of the book. Uh, really quickly, um, the date of composition of the book is, you know, fairly late as far as Old Testament books go. Uh, most commentators believe that it was composed sometime during the second century. So it would have been either during the Hasmonean period or just before that, probably during the time of the Ptolemies, uh, which sounds about right when you look at the type of Greek that the Book of Wisdom is uh, written in. There is a lot of language in there that is <clears throat> Alexandrian in flavor, you could say, uh, which would indicate that the authors of this text, although they are clearly Jewish, uh, are also familiar with the Greek thought prevailing during their time. And another interesting note about the Wisdom of Solomon is that it's also written in a fairly um, sophisticated form of Greek. So this is one of those things that um, people who learn Greek learn to appreciate, which is that different books of either Septuagint or the Greek New Testament are written in different uh, levels of Greek. So something like uh, the Gospel of John or the Epistles of John would be written in a very simple, almost Semitic Greek style, whereas books such as Hebrews or Luke Acts are much more polished, sometimes almost classical. Uh, in the way they're written, which indicates that the writer is very fluent in Greek. And the Book of Wisdom is closer to that end of the spectrum. So this is um, the type of Greek that you would le learn to read in a more upper intermediate or advanced um, class on biblical Greek. Uh, so we know that whoever the author is, he is definitely somebody who knew Greek very well and is also at the same time well steeped in the jewish tradition uh, and you can see that the author combines the best of both worlds both the jewish wisdom tradition and the greek wisdom tradition which leads us to the question of the author uh, so it's called the wisdom of solomon so there is a connection being made between solomon and the author of the book in fact in a Catechism of the Catholic Church, there's one paragraph, 283, where the Wisdom of Solomon is quoted, specifically chapter 7, 
verses 17 to 22, and it is said to be by Solomon. So you can see here, with Solomon, they can say, and then here's the quote from the book. So from a Catholic perspective, there is some kind of connection between Solomon and this book, but exactly how that connection is, is a little less clear. Now we know from previous study that Solomon was a writer of Proverbs and other wisdom works. Uh, let's go back to that passage in 1 Kings 4. In verse 32, it says, He also spoke 3,000 Proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. Now we know that many of them ended up in the book of Proverbs, but if you look at the book of Proverbs, it's not quite 3,000. Maybe about 1,000 of his Proverbs made a cut, which means there's another 2,000 Proverbs by him that didn't end up there. So it's possible that many of them circulated orally. So that one of the theories uh, behind the composition of the Book of Wisdom is that it represents some of those other Proverbs of Solomon that maybe uh, they circulated orally for much longer. They weren't quite, they didn't quite make the cut in the older Book of Proverbs, but then at some later point, uh, a learned Jew um, decided to translate them into Greek and, um, you know, and then write them down as their own separate book, and that's how we end up with the book of the book of wisdom. Now, this is of course strengthened by the fact that the book of wisdom itself seems to present itself as Solomon. We see this, for example, in um, chapter seven, verses one to fourteen. So let's read this whole passage, shall we? I also am mortal, like all men, a descendant of the first-formed child of earth, and in the womb of a mother I was molded into flesh. Within the period of ten months, compacted with blood, from the seed of a woman and the pleasure of marriage. And when I was born, I began to breathe the common air, and fell upon the kindred earth, and my first sound was a cry like that of all. I was nursed with care in swaddling cloths. For no king has had a different beginning of existence. There is for all mankind one entrance into life and a common departure. Therefore I prayed, and understanding was given me. I called upon God, and the spirit of wisdom came to me. I preferred her to scepters and thrones, and accounted wealth as nothing in comparison with her. Neither did I liken to her any priceless gem, because all gold is but a little sand in her sight, and silver will be accounted as clay before her. I loved her more than wealth and beauty, and I chose to have her rather than light, because her radiance never ceases. All good things came to me along with her, and in her hands uncounted wealth. I rejoiced in them all, because wisdom leads them, but I did not know that she was their mother. I learned without guile, and I impart without grudging. I did, do not hide her wealth, for it is an unfailing treasure for mankind. Those who get it obtain friendship with God, commended for the gifts that come from instruction. So just from reading this, it sounds a lot like Solomon. So it's talking about how he prayed and received understanding. and talks about how, along with wisdom, he received all good things as well. If you recall, back when we were doing First Kings, in the third chapter, we have Solomon's prayer for wisdom and God blesses him for choosing wisdom by giving him all the other stuff that he asks for. So this sounds like Solomon. Uh, on the other hand, there is a recognition uh, fairly early on in tradition that uh, the connection between uh, the Book of Wisdom and Solomon isn't quite that straightforward. So. If you look at the um, Muratorian canon, which is a second century canon list, it actually lists the Book of Wisdom as one of the canonical books, but it doesn't list it as one of the um, doesn't list it as one of the um, writings of Solomon. So actually, in there, it is said that the book is written by the friends of Solomon. And not only that, it's even listed as a book of the New Testament. So uh, the Muratorian canon seems to indicate that from fairly early on, 
it was thought that the Book of Wisdom may have been written in honor of Solomon, but not by Solomon himself. This is also the opinion of St. Augustine. So, interestingly, um, St. Augustine recognized the Book of Wisdom as scripture, but he didn't regard it as Solomonic. So here is a quote by St. Augustine, and this is taken from his book on Christian doctrine. Next are the three books of Solomon, the Proverbs, Song of Songs, and Ecclesiastes. For two books, one called Wisdom and the other Ecclesiasticus, are ascribed to Solomon from a certain resemblance of style, but the most likely opinion is they are written, they were written by Jesus, son of Sirach. Still, they are to be reckoned among the prophetical books since they are, have attained recognition as being authoritative. So... Interestingly, according to St. Augustine, both Wisdom and Sirach were written by uh, the same person. So you have these two traditions, one that says that this book comes from Solomon in some way. Perhaps uh, they were the rest of his oral sayings put down training at a later point. But then there's this other tradition that these were composed in honor of Solomon, but were not composed by Solomon himself. Um, now, there is precedent for both opinions, and, you know, one can easily go either way uh, based on the evidence. So I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't make either opinion a hill to die on. Uh, that's the most I can say, but it's good to be open to both theories. Um, now, as far as the book goes, uh, one of the interesting things about it is the type of language it uses. Actually, I uh, already touched upon this, but a lot of the language that uh, is used in the Greek text actually can be found in a lot of Greek philosophy. So in Petrie and Bergsma, they actually have a whole list of that. Um, and this is one of the other reasons, by the way, why some people question whether this goes all the way back to Solomon because uh, all the Greek terms that are found in the book are not the sort of things that you would expect from a Jewish king. Uh, most likely, while there might be some there might be some connection to Solomon, the parts that use Greek uh, philosophical terminology may be the contemporary author. Uh, inserting his own ideas into the text or making his own original composition. So here is a list of some of those uh, Greek terms that are found there. And this is going to be important once we connect Book of Wisdom to the New Testament a little bit later on because some of that same language finds its way into the New Testament but in such a way that they clearly uh, were derived from the Book of Wisdom. Uh, also, one final note before we get to the theological themes is how this book ended up in the Latin Vulgate. So one, so Saint Jerome is well known for having been not completely convinced of the canonicity of these books. So according to the Catholic commentary on Holy Scripture, uh, Saint Jerome didn't really write the Vulgate version of wisdom. Rather, it was a later author after St. Jerome who translated the text into Latin and included it in our current manuscripts of the Latin Vulgate. Um, it's well known to a lot of scholars of the Vulgate that a large chunk of that text didn't actually come from St. Jerome, but is the work of a later author. So the Book of Wisdom happens to be one of them. Um, and if you read the Book of Wisdom in the Vulgate version, you'll see that it does have a bit of a different flavor of Latin from the other books in the Old Testament. So let's look at some of the themes of the book. Uh, we can turn off some of these other tabs because we won't need them anymore. Now, when it comes to uh, the Book of Wisdom, it's similar in style to the Book of Proverbs in that a lot of it is based on seeking wisdom and living wisely. 
but there's less here of what we would call practical wisdom. I mean, there is plenty of practical wisdom here, but the Book of Wisdom is more of a philosophical um, treatise on the importance of wisdom, and a good chunk of it is also dedicated to showing how wisdom can be found from reading salvation history. So the first chapter of it is talking about the importance of wisdom and righteousness. So first 11 verses uh, read as follows. Love righteousness, you rulers of the earth. Think of the Lord with uprightness and seek him with sincerity of heart, because he is found by those who do not put him to the test and manifest himself to those who do not distrust him. For perverse thoughts separate people from God, and when his power is tested, it convicts the foolish. Because wisdom will not enter a deceitful soul, or dwell in a body enslaved to sin. For a holy and disciplined spirit will flee from deceit, and will rise and depart from foolish thoughts, and will be ashamed at the approach of unrighteousness. For wisdom is a kindly spirit, and will not free a blasphemer from the guilt of his words, because God is witness of his inmost feelings, and a true observer of his heart, and a hearer of his tongue. Because the Spirit of the Lord has filled the world, and that which holds all things together knows what is said. Therefore, no one who utters unrighteous things will escape notice, and justice, when it punishes, will not pass him by. For inquiry will be made into the counsels of an ungodly man, and a report of his words will come to the Lord, to convict him of his lawless deeds. Because a jealous ear hears all things, and the sound of murmurings does not go unheard. Beware then of useless murmuring, and keep your tongue from slander. Because no secret word is without result, and a lying mouth destroys the soul. Now that sounds very similar to how Proverbs starts off. So if you remember, we read um, the, book of, the beginning of Proverbs. And if you compare it with the first seven verses of that book, there's a very similar flavor to it, especially when you get to the seventh verse where it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So wisdom is drawing on the same idea. Now that idea continues on to the rest of the second chapter. We'll come back to this shortly later on because there's a very important passage here about the righteous man who the wicked persecute. Um, but there's a lot of theological richness, richness here, and especially when you get to the last four verses of this chapter, you have an inkling of what we would call the doctrine of original sin. Now, there is this notion prevalent among a lot of people that uh, the doctrine of original sin is a New Testament concept, quote-unquote, and that you don't really see it prior to the writings of the Apostle Paul. But that's not exactly true. You see inklings of original sin in such passages as Psalm 51, verse 5, where it says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Or think about Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, where it says, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now we see another um, description of the doctrine of original sin in the book of wisdom. In chapter 2, verses 21 to 24, it says the following. Thus they reasoned, but they were led astray, for their wickedness blinded them, and they did not know the secret purposes of God, or hope for the wages of holiness, or discern the prize for blameless souls. For God created mankind for incorruption, and made him in the image of his own character. But through the devil's envy, death entered the world, and those who belong to his party experience it. So death is something that enters the world through the envy of the devil. And that is very similar to St. Paul's saying in Romans 5, where it says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. So we can see the beginnings of that doctrine here. Uh, interestingly, the Catechism actually uses this passage as uh, one of its proofs for original sin. Uh, quotes from Gaudium et Spes, uh, chapter 18, verse 2. So here is paragraph 
1008 uh, in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Death is a consequence of sin. The Church's magisterium, as authentic interpreter of the affirmations of scripture and tradition, teaches that death entered the world on account of man's sin. Even though man's nature is mortal, God had destined him not to die. Death was therefore contrary to the plans of God the Creator and entered the world as a consequence of sin. Bodily death, from which man would have been immune had he not sinned, is thus the last enemy of man to be conquered. And you will see that in the footnotes of this paragraph, Wisdom Chapter 2 is quoted. So according to the Catechism, the teaching that death is a consequence of sin is derived from this passage of Scripture. Now, what, although it talks about death, it also talks about the destiny of the righteous. So, fun fact, um, in funeral masses, there are multiple options for the Old Testament reading, and two of the options for the Old Testament reading in a funeral mass are Wisdom chapter 3, verses 1 to 9, and Wisdom chapter 4, verses 7 to 15. So if you're planning your funeral, you may want to consider this as one of the readings for that. Uh, other than that, it's great for Memento Mori. Um, I'm going to read those two sections of Wisdom, and you can see how uh, they furnish the reader with a good meditation on uh, the happy death of the righteous man. So wisdom 3, 1 to 9. But the souls of the righteous are in the hand of God, and no torment will ever touch them. In the eyes of the foolish they seem to have died, and their departure was thought to be an evil thing, and their going from us to be their destruction. But they are at peace, for though in the sight of man they were punished, their hope is full of mortality. Having been disciplined a little, they will receive great good because God tested them and found them worthy of himself. Like gold in the furnace, he tried them, and like a sacrificial whole burnt offering, he accepted them. In the time of their visitation, they will shine forth and will run like sparks through the stubble. They will govern nations and rule over peoples, and the Lord will reign over them forever. Those who trust in him will understand truth, and the faithful will abide with him in love because grace and mercy are upon his holy ones, and he watch over his chosen. And then that's, of course, contrasted with the ungodly uh, here. Now the second reading uh, is chapter 4, 7 to 15, which says, But the righteous man, though he die early, will be at rest. For old age is not honored for length of time, or measured by number of years. But understanding is gray hair for human beings, and a blameless life is ripe old age. There was one who pleased God and was loved by him, and while living among sinners, he was taken up. He was caught up lest evil change his understanding or guile deceive his soul. For the fascination of wickedness obscures what is good, and roving desire perverts the innocent mind. Being perfected in a short time, he fulfilled long years, for his soul was pleasing to the Lord. Therefore, he took him quickly from the midst of wickedness. Yet the peoples saw and did not understand or take such a thing to heart that God's grace and mercy are with his elect, and he watches over his holy ones. Uh, you can see that uh, this continues the tradition that we saw in Job and Ecclesiastes of meditating upon why the righteous seem to die early, whereas the wicked uh, live long. So according to this, uh, we should not judge um, a person's uh, life based on how long they live because sometimes the righteous live only for a short time and the wicked will live long but their long life does not afford them any benefit because it only gives them a, you know more opportunities to heap judgment on themselves incidentally this parallels uh, Isaiah 57 verse 1 which talks about how um, for the righteous, an early death is actually a mercy because they can be with God early and are spared from the evils of this world. So it says here in verses uh, 1 and 2 this, the following. The righteous man perishes and no one lays it to heart. Devout men are taken away while no one understands. For the righteous man is taken away from calamity. He enters into peace. They rest in their beds who walk in their uprightness. 
um, you can see a lot of connections between uh, the Book of Wisdom as well as to the rest of the Bible, both Old and New Testaments. So uh, there is a fundamental continuity in the thought that they are presenting us. The next section is on the beauty of wisdom. So you will see a long description of wisdom. It's similar in language to Proverbs 8, which talks about wisdom being the companion of God, uh, as well as wisdom, not, sorry, Proverbs 9, which talks about how wisdom calls upon to us that we may obtain her and live according to her. So there is a lot here that speaks to um, the importance of wisdom. And one of the two things, there are two things that are very interesting about wisdom as she is portrayed in this book. One is that wisdom is connected to God's spirit. So there's this idea of the Holy Spirit and that, that is related in some way to wisdom. And then there's also the idea of wisdom being God's radiance, which is language that, as we'll see shortly, uh, is picked up by the book of Hebrews. Uh, but notice something. While wisdom does have some similarities to the divine logos, um, as we see in the New Testament, it's not a one-to-one -one correlation. Uh, in fact, um, you could probably get into some trouble if you try to connect too too closely because there are some descriptions of wisdom that in these books that would seem to indicate that she is seen as a creation rather than an eternal um, hypostasis of God. Um, but there is enough similarity that you can see that the doctrine of the divine logos is uh, being forecasted in the book of wisdom. Um, now, I actually want to show you some of the passages that speak of wisdom as a spirit. So the first one is Wisdom 1.6, where it says, For wisdom is a kindly spirit and will not free a blasphemer from the guilt of his words. So uh, we already read this earlier, but notice wisdom is called a kindly spirit. So, uh, Nefma Sophia. Uh, and he, she is called a philanthropon. So a lover of man. So wisdom, the spirit of wisdom is a lover of man, literally in the Greek. And then you get to wisdom, chapter 7, verses 22 to 23. Uh, for wisdom, the fashion of all things taught me. For in her there is a spirit that is intelligent, holy, unique, manifold, subtle, mobile, clear, unpolluted, distinct, invulnerable, loving the good, keen, irresistible, beneficent, humane, steadfast, sure, free from anxiety, all-powerful, overseeing all and penetrating through all spirits that are intelligent and pure and subtlest. Now you can see hints of the divine nature of, the, of wisdom here through some of these descriptions, uh, all-powerful and overseeing all. So, there, so some of the omni-attributes are um, attributed to wisdom. And, of course, it says that in her is a spirit. Um, so there is a connection between the spirit, but here also um, there is also a bit of a distinction because the spirit is said to be in her. And then finally, you have wisdom 9, verse 17. So... Who has learned your counsel and thus you have given wisdom and sent your Holy Spirit from on high? So, Bulin de su ti segno, emi su edoka sofian ke pemsas to agion, su nefma apopsiston. So, Sophia and nefma are placed uh, next to each other in a parallelism. If you recall, in our episode on the Psalms, we talked about the idea of Hebrew parallelism, where two lines which are placed next to each other, are meant to convey the same thought. So the fact that wisdom and the Holy Spirit are placed next to each other in a parallelism in this way would suggest that they're seen as uh, the same thing. 
Um, after this discussion of the importance of wisdom, uh, the remaining 10 chapters of the Book of Wisdom are a meditation on salvation history. So here is where it helps to know your Old Testament because there is a number of allusions to various Old Testament characters, even though they are not mentioned uh, it, by name. For example, wisdom protected the first formed father of the world when he alone had been created. She delivered him from his transgression and gave him strength to rule all things. So that's a reference to Adam right there. <clears throat> but when an unrighteous man departed from her in his anger, he perished because in rage he killed his brother. That's referring to Cain and Abel. When the world, when the earth was flooded because of him, wisdom was saved. Wisdom again saved it, steering the righteous man by a paltry piece of wood. So that is a reference to Noah. So you see uh, this theme go on and on. The references to Noah are particularly um, important because you can see here um, he is saved by a piece of wood and then a later down the road in chapter 11 there is a verse actually uh, let me find it uh -huh. ah, it's actually in chapter 14 verse 7 where it says blessed is the wood by which righteousness comes so it's interesting um, the word for wood here is actually the word uh, xilon which is also used to mean tree and there is a passage in the book of acts where that same word xilon is used to refer to the cross so uh, in one of the passages, in one of the speeches in the book of Acts, um, I believe it was St. Peter who talked about how um, Christ was nailed to a xilon, or translated in most English versions as a tree. And from you can see how the language of the book of wisdom seems to almost be a messianic prophecy in a way. Here's the passage um there are actually multiple passages in the book of acts now I look at it that use the word tree as a description for the cross so in acts 5 30 it says the god of our fathers raised jesus whom you killed by hanging him on a xilon so blessed is the xilon by which righteousness comes and it, does, it also helps that the word for righteousness is that familiar phrase, dikeosini, which is often translated as justification in St. Paul's letters, among other places. So you can look, you can easily see how um, Wisdom 14.7 could be interpreted as a foreshadowing of justification through Christ. In a way, you can even translate this as saying, blessed is the cross by which justification comes. Now, there is a lengthy section between chapters 13 and 16 to talk about um, the folly of idols. Um, this would make sense if you consider the Hellenistic background of the book because the Jews who composed this would have been surrounded by Greeks who... Um, composed um, idols made of marble and clay and this is meant to dissuade the Jewish people from worshiping those idols and a lot of the language there is also similar to um, Isaiah 40 through 47 the trial of the gods as it's often called talking about how it is utterly useless to worship them and this is a good segue to talking about the connection between the uh, with the book of wisdom in the New Testament. Now, with the New Testament doesn't come right out and say it's quoting the book of wisdom, but there are many allusions to the book of wisdom in the New Testament. Uh, in fact, if you have a copy of the UBS Greek New Testament, there is an index at the back called Index of Allusions in Verbal Parallels, and there's a whole section on allusions to the book of wisdom here. 
so I'll hold it up on the screen. Um, there's well over a dozen allusions to the Book of Wisdom in the New Testament. So the authors of Scripture are well aware of this book and were allowed themselves to be influenced by it. I wouldn't go so far as to say this is evidence that they regarded it as divinely inspired, but definitely uh, makes it more plausible to think so. Now, if you look at the Book of Wisdom, chapter 7, verses 24 to 27, there's an interesting de description of wisdom here. Um, For wisdom is more mobile than any motion. Because of her pureness, she pervades and penetrates all things. For she is a breath of the power of God and a pure emanation of the glory of the Almighty. Therefore, nothing defiled gains entrance into her, for she is a reflection of eternal light, a spotless mirror of the working of God and an image of his goodness. Though she is but one, she can do all things, and while remaining in herself, she renews all things. And every generation, she passes into holy souls and makes them friends of God and prophets. So it talks about how the how wisdom is the basically an emanation of God. Um, if you look at verse 25 and verse 26, there's some um, interesting language here. Um, so the word reflection is apavrasma here. And the word for image is ekon. And this language can also be found in the book of Hebrews. So... Let's pull up Hebrews as our parallel passage, and I'll make sure to have the Greek New Testament open so you can see how they are similar to each other. Long ago, at many times and many place, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Uh, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, have become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. So the same word that we just saw here, apavrasma, also appears in verse 3. He is the apavrasma of the glory of God. And he is the charakter of of his hypostasis. Um, so charakter is the idea of a, if you put a stamp on something, the stamp bears an exact replica of the image of the thing that was used to stamp it, which is similar to the word ekon as it is used here. Um, and of course, it's also said that she renews all things. Uh, the idea is that the world is um, has its existence because of wisdom, similar to how um, it says here that Christ upholds the universe by the word of his power. And that icon language also appears in Colossians. So uh, in the in this uh, Christ hymn that appears in chapter one, verse starting with verse fifteen, it says. Os esti ne contu theu to auratu prototokos pasis ktisios. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Notice that the word ekon also appears here. So apavgasma and ekon, two words used to describe wisdom, are also used to describe Christ in the New Testament. Now, this language, of course, also influences the Nicene Creed. Although it doesn't use the exact language uh, that wisdom uses, the general idea uh, is reflected in it. When it talks about Christ being God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made. Uh, lurking in the background of the Creed are passages like Wisdom 7, as well as Colossians 1 and Hebrews 1. And another interesting thing is how wisdom is referred to as the word of God. There is one passage in particular that makes this connection. And this is chapter 18, verse 15. 
ο παντοδύναμος σου λόγος από ουρανών εκ θρόνων βασιλέων απότομος πολεμιστής εσ μέσον της ολετρίας ύλατο ρίς ξύφος οξύτην ανυπόκριτον επιτάριν σου φέρον. So the word logos um, is here. So your all-powerful world word leap from heaven from the royal throne into the midst of the land that was doomed. And also another omni attribute, panto dinamos, all powerful. So wisdom is all knowing and all powerful and can see all things. So there are a lot of hints in the book of wisdom that wisdom is divine. And here's another one. And of course, uh, this language is well known to us thanks to the Gospel of John. Where it says, in logos, ke logos in proston theon, ke theos in logos. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So, you, was the Gospel of John influenced by the Book of Wisdom? It is quite probable that that is the case. Uh, at the very least, uh, we can say that the Gospel of John is drawing from a wisdom tradition that is also reflected by the wisdom of Solomon. Other than that, uh, the Book of Wisdom has a robust theology of God's nature and God's uh, God being seen through nature as well as God being sovereign over all things. Uh, and this seems to be behind a lot of St. Paul's affirmations in Romans as well. So uh, for this, I'm going to first read the relevant passages from Romans and then I'll show you which passages in the Book of Wisdom are parallel to it. So in Romans 1 verses 18 through 20, it says the following, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. So according to this, uh, St. Paul believes that everyone can know God through observing nature. Now this idea is not original to St. Paul. Uh, the Book of Wisdom also has the same concept. So in... Wisdom chapter 13, um, the author makes the argument that uh, those who worship idols are uh, foolish because they know who the true God is based on nature. So let's read the first 10 verses. For all men who are ignorant of God were foolish by nature, and they were unable from the good things that are seen to know him who exists. Nor did they recognize the artisan while paying heed to his works. But they suppose that either fire or wind or swift air or the circle of the stars or turbulent water or the luminary, luminaries of heaven were the gods that rule the world. If through delight in the beauty of these things, people assume them to be gods, let them know how much better than these is their Lord, for the author of beauty created them. And if people were amazed at their power and working, let them perceive from them how much more powerful is he who formed them. For from the greatness and beauty of created things comes the corresponding perception of their creator. Yet these people are little to be blamed, for perhaps they go astray while seeking God and desiring to find him. For as they live among his works, and they keep searching, and they trust in what they see, because the things that are seen are beautiful. Yet again, not even they are to be excused, for if they had the power to know so much that they could investigate the world, how did they fail to find sooner the Lord these things? But miserable, with their hopes set on dead things, and those who give the name gods to works of human hands, gold and silver, fashioned with skill, and likenesses of animals, or useless stone, the work of an ancient hand. So you can see here uh, that according to wisdom, the... Those who make idols are seeking uh, the creator, but they are unable to uh, properly perceive him and instead attribute what they see uh, to idols. So continuing the parallel with St. Paul, in verses 21 to 24, St. Paul says the following, 
For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man in birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So you can see. Yeah, besides this, the idea of God's sovereignty is also uh, reflected in the Book of Wisdom. So in Romans 9, verses 19 to 23, uh, we have the famous uh, potter and clay analogy that St. Paul uses. So St. Paul writes, You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? Who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder? Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, in order to make known the riches of his glory for the vessels of mercy which he has prepared beforehand for glory? And a lot of people um, look at this, and of course, they're, and they get confused by this language because there's this ongoing debate in Christianity about how you balance out uh, God's sovereignty with human free will. And of course, there are many ways that this question has been answered. Um, from an Orthodox Catholic perspective, we affirm both free will and predestination to be true. We don't sacrifice one for the sake of the other. Um, and that is what distinguishes us from, say, Calvinists who lean heavily into the idea of sovereignty, but in such a way that free will is compromised. Um, now, this language of the potter and the clay is also found in the book of Jeremiah. So I don't have the exact chapter on hand. I believe it's somewhere in chapter 15 or 16. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but not a lot of people know that similar language also appears in the Book of Wisdom. And these are scattered in different verses, so let's look at what some of them are. Um, in Wisdom 11, 21 and 22, it says the following, For it is always in your power to show great strength, and who can withstand the might of your arm? So it's similar to, it says, who can resist his will here. Because the whole world before you is like a speck that tips the scales and like a drop of morning dew that falls upon the ground. Now this is balanced out, of course, by the fact that it says here that in verse 23 to 24, that God is merciful to all. But you are merciful to all, for you can do all things, and you overlook people's sins that they may repent. For you love all things that exist and loathe none of the things that you have made. For you would not have made anything if you had hated it. So um, in wisdom, that strong affirmation of sovereignty is balanced out by a strong affirmation of God loving and showing mercy to all. Uh, next, you have wisdom chapter 12, verse 12. For who will say, what have you done? Or who will resist your judgment? Who will accuse you for the destruction of nations that you made? Or who will come before you to plead as an advocate for the righteous? Ne for neither is there any God besides you who cares for all, to whom you should prove that you have not judged unjustly. Nor can any king or monarch confront you about those whom you've punished. So I'm... You know, you can read the whole passage, but the idea here is that God is infinitely wise and infinitely powerful, and he can do all things, and no one can say to him that what he has done is unjust. Uh, once again, you can see a similarity to what St. Paul here says. Um, and then, besides this, there's one other passage worth reading. So in the book of Wisdom, chapter 5, uh, verse 7, you have the potter analogy uh, appearing again. And interestingly here, it's used it to 
deride those who make idols. For a potter needs the soft earth and laboriously molds each vessel for our service. But out of the same clay he fashions both the vessels that serve clean uses and those for contrary uses, making all in like matter. But which shall be the use of each of these, the worker in clay decides. Goes on to talk about how the pagans will use the same clay to make idols. Um, but that's another uh, theme. But here's the idea that the potter has sovereignty over the clay. So uh, St. Paul is most likely thinking of this passage when he wrote what he wrote in uh, Romans 9. So you can see here that there are many uh, hyperlinks between Romans and the Book of Wisdom. St. Paul, being an educated Jew, would most likely have been familiar with the book and had it at the back of his mind in a number of places. But there is one more passage that is important for us to know about. In fact, this is arguably the most famous passage in the Book of Wisdom. But in order, before we get there, I want to read one chapter from the Gospel of Matthew. Um, so actually, we'll read, we'll start by reading verse one, 41, go up to verse 44. So Matthew 27. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Uh, he is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers who were with him also reviled him in the same way. So you can see that everybody was mocking Jesus on the cross. Now, if you look closely at the mockery that is hurled upon Jesus in this passage, there is a close connection between that and Wisdom chapter 2, which we said we would get back to. Now, when this passage was originally written, the author may have had in mind the generic righteous person uh, because there are many people in history that undoubtedly would have fit this description. And in fact, uh, some commentators have suggested that the author may have had uh, Plato's trial and apology in mind when he wrote this, seeing Socrates as the archetype of the righteous man who was wrongly condemned to death. Be that as it may, we can see how the language um, becomes a foreshadowing of the sufferings of Christ. Um, it begins in verse 10, where it says the following. Let us oppress the righteous poor man. Let us not spare the widow or regard the gray hairs of the aged. But let our night be our law of right, for what is weak proves itself to be useless. Let us lie and wait for the righteous man, because he is inconvenient to us and opposes our actions. He reproaches us for sins against the law and accuses us for sins against our training. He professes to have knowledge of God and calls himself a child of the Lord. He became to us a reproof of our thoughts. The very sight of him is a burden to us because his manner of life is unlike that of others and his ways are strange. We are considered by him as something base and he avoids our ways as unclean. He calls the last end of the righteous happy and boasts that God is his father. Let's see if his words are true and let us test what will happen at the end of his life. For if the righteous man is God's son, he will help him, and he will deliver him from the hand of his adversaries. Let us test him with insult and torture, that we may find out how gentle he is, and make trial of his forbearance. Let us condemn him to a shameful death, for, according to what he says, he will be protected. So the persecution of the righteous one. You can see how many things here... Uh, line up with how Jesus is portrayed in the Gospels, especially in the Passion. Um, and one of the, some of the most poignant parallels have to do with the fact that the righteous man question is considered a son of God, a peda kiryu. So peda uh, is one of the um, words for child in Greek. There's two words, eos and uh, pedon. 
Uh, this word also has the double meaning of servant. Uh, so you can also understand it as he calls himself a servant of the Lord. And of course, he, uh, he calls God his father. Okay. Um, so he is the son of God and God is his father. And they say here, if you are truly God's son, then he will rescue you. That sounds a lot like uh, what the persecutors of Jesus say in Matthew 27, 43, uh, which makes it quite probable that uh, St. Matthew was also familiar with the Book of Wisdom and was deliberately mirroring some of its language. But here we see the fact that uh, the archetypal righteous man is perfectly embodied in the person of Christ, uh, who is the perfect example of what the author has in mind. Um, in fact, some commentators have suggested that this passage right here is the reason why this book didn't make it into the Jewish canon. Now, of course, uh, that's not the only reason. There's also the fact that uh, they also refused to include anything in the Hebrew Bible that was originally composed in Greek. And the wisdom of Solomon is written in Greek. But the other main reason it would appear why the Jews ultimately did not include this in their canon is because the Christians found this book to be a very convenient uh, proof text for the sufferings of the Messiah. And as a result, they decided not to include this uh, among their inspired books. Um, so that, in a nutshell, are all of the main points of interest in the Book of Wisdom. So you can see how uh, there's a lot of depth to this book and there's a lot of parallels with the New Testament that yield a lot of rich theological fruit. And we'll see a lot of similar stuff later down the road when we get to the Book of Sirach. So hopefully you guys found that helpful. Thank you for that, Lewis. Really excited about the next one. And uh, again, I appreciate you going yeah. over. Before we, before we go, I'm yeah. scanning the comments section and it looks like we have a bit of. Um, uh, yeah, grab whatever you want. There. Uh, let me see. So if he has a question. So Frank mm -hmm. Larda has a question here. What? Will we be given peoples and nations over which to govern in the afterlife, or does this pertain to the here and now? So this is why this is why I believe in progressive revelation. So not everything is clear in the Old Testament. So uh, in the New Testament, it does talk about uh, us being given judging the nations, uh, but that seems to be an eschatological thing. So. We will become rulers and kings on the last day. So I would say that um, the this is something that will happen eventually, but not at the present moment. He also asks interesting question: Wis the Holy Spirit is expressed as feminine pronoun. Uh, why is that? We know the Holy Spirit in the masculine. So uh, this is grammar. Uh, so gender, as it is applied to the Holy Spirit, is a little bit tricky when it comes to the Bible. So in Hebrew, Ruach uh, HaKodesh is feminine. And in Greek, you have Nefma, which is a neuter. Uh, so it's neither feminine nor masculine. But then you have Parakletos in the upper uh, room discourse. And that is definitely, um, definitely the uh, masculine. So is the Holy Spirit a he, a she, or an it? Well, based on biblical language, the answer seems to be all three. So it's hard to, you know, I, I, I know I make it, some people make a big deal that, oh, don't call the Holy Spirit an it because the Holy Spirit is a person, you know, not an impersonal force. But sometimes the Holy Spirit is called an it in the Bible because the neuter is used. Um, let me see. Do we, have I missed anything? Um, there's some interesting discussion here about... Uh, I've seen Protestants deeply ponder this passage when they're first told about, and in my opinion, it's a strong opener to the Deuterocanonical books for those that initially reject them. 
I think that for an open-minded Protestant, that is probably true. If you show them Wisdom Chapter 2, uh, they're, you know, especially if you connect it to something like Isaiah 53, which is the most famous uh, Messianic passage, I think that it will be quite the eye-opener seeing how God placed hints of the Messiah in this book, which makes it harder to see this as just another non-inspired text. Although I would suspect that some of the more um, more resistant Protestants will uh, try to argue against this. However, it will be a little hard to argue against seeing this as messianic without inadvertently undercutting um, something like Isaiah 53, which both Catholics and Protestants would agree is a messianic passage. So I hope that helps. Yeah, excellent. I think that's it. All the others, I believe, are just uh, comments. A lot of good interaction today. People are really enjoying this, and I did as well. Yes. Yeah, looking forward to the next one. That should be in uh, just a few weeks. Any uh, other uh, parting words that you wanted to get in there? Anything that maybe you want to also put in a plug for? Uh, no. I think that uh, you know the only real thing that we have up next would be the next Bible commentary, which mm -hmm. hopefully we'll get around to either late September, early October. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it should be pretty soon. I'll let y'all know. Once again, thanks so much for coming on, Lewis, and thank y'all for watching and for participating there. Hit the like button and the subscribe button. Put a comment there also in the comment section. The more you interact with this video, the more it will be shared on YouTube. So if you thought that this was a great video and you want people to hear it, definitely interact with it. You have to do your part, though. If you do your part, the YouTube algorithm will, will do it. And uh, again, it will spread to more people. Well, anyways, that's going to do it. We'll see you later.